All right. Good morning, everybody. So uh, my name is Marty Chilvis. I'm the uh, field crop pathologist here at, at Michigan State University. If you guys have any questions as we go, please sing out. Um, so we work on diseases of corn, wheat, soybean, dry bean, uh, and a few other bits and pieces. Um, I guess maybe we'll just start talking about the equipment to get going. There really isn't a great deal of wheat disease out there this year, at least what, from what we've seen. Mm -hmm. A little bit of powdery mildew, but nowhere near as bad as last year, my take on it. Does anyone have any disagreement with that? Anyone seen anything else? The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, wheat viruses. Uh, just as a quick sort of refresher reminder, like they can be a real problem and we've been burnt here um, on campus where we've had um, you know, last year's wheat that wasn't terminated properly in the fresh planting. We had that wheat leaf curl mite and it, it moved from one field to the other and brought with it wheat streak mosaic virus. And that was a real problem for us. It messed up yield and, and a whole bunch of areas. So be very mindful of what you have out there in terms of rotations and, and other potential impacts. We haven't really done a great deal of extension with respect to um, wheat viruses. So we might try and get a survey, a statewide survey going in the next couple of years just to refresh, refresh our um, knowledge and information on that. But just something to be aware of. And if you see anything odd that you're not sure what it is, please send it into the diagnostic clinic. The wheat program is paying for that and it, it, it's um, a very uh, valuable service. Um, so anyway, really important to know what's out there if, if you're trying to manage um, particular issues. All right, so I guess let's talk a little bit about the equipment here. Um, so this is our um, high clearance sprayer. So we use this for plot spraying. Um, obviously we've got a, a larger boom, 30 foot boom on the front for maintenance and herbicides and whatnot. Um, the beauty of this though is that we've got 24 different booms through here um, and 24 cans above so we can stack a whole bunch of different products together. So if we're going through the field we've got a, you know, a bunch of products to put on we can get them all loaded, run through with a, a map that Bill organises. Where did Bill head to? He's out chatting on the phone again. Anyway, um, and it's all GPS trips so we don't have to run up in there in the cab and flip switches on and off to, to get the right product the right spot which is good. We rely on the GPS. Okay. All the booms are offset appropriately, you know, with the, the distance back. Um, because, every, you know, from start to finish, or what about a yard or so, a yard and a half or a yard and a bit from one end to the other. So, um, yeah, they will trigger as we drive through the field. And it's important for us to have accuracy as well because our plots are about 20 foot long, right? Because we cram a lot of different trials in a little area. And we actually have our wheat research on the agronomy farm. This wheat here is actually just to try and take care of some white mold issues we had in our soybeans. We've got another fantastic location for white mold up at the Montcalm Research Station. We don't want white mold here. We want this for seed treatment trials and maybe some frog eye leaf spot uh, fungicide trials. So we have quite a bit of white mold, probably because I'm irrigating and pushing irrigation to get diseases, right? So what we did to try and fix that, um, that white mold issue is to no-till this wheat in and then Bill went through and put down some contans as well, a biological, to try and kill those white mold sclerotia. So doing everything we can just to try and take out that, that white mold because we don't want it affecting our soybean work. Anyway, so our main, main plot work is over at the agronomy farm and there we have an irrigation system as well to you know, mimic wet conditions, to make sure we get head scab and all of that. Um, uh, that system is a linear system that we have over there. This is a, a center pivot that we have access to here. So. Um, and over there we've got a, a, a bunch of different trials. We've got fungicide timing trials, um, a lot of fungicide efficacy trials, and in your handout today, uh, you don't have to pull it out now, but we have a, f a fungicide efficacy guide. And so that's informed by these trials that we do. Um, not just us, but colleagues in Wisconsin, Indiana, or anywhere else that's doing uh, wheat work. We discuss the different um, products that we're seeing and the efficacy we're getting out of those products. Uh, for disease management. So some of those trials include things like a, a flag leaf application timing to look at those products specifically to try and control foliar diseases and rank those different products. Uh, and of course we have a lot of head scab um, trials as well. Um, underneath here as well we've got two different nozzle types. The green ones here that you can see along the end here are flat fan setup and that's for our foliar diseases. 
and then through the middle here they sent a four nozzles we've got twin jets any idea why we've got twin jet on here as well for wheat head scab screen yeah exactly thanks Ty so head scab applications right so these twin jets what the intention there is to get the best coverage we can of that head if we use the, a flat fan you're only really going to get coverage of that front side maybe the top of the wheat head right but having that that twin jet those angled uh, jets going through you get a better coverage of the front and the back side of the wheat to try and get the best you know, coverage as possible that's critical if you're trying to you know go after head scab management getting that product on uh, where you need it uh, these nozzles probably would not work commercially because we drive at about three mile an hour right so much much slower than the 10 to 12 that you guys might be doing but the similar principle applies you're going to want to set up maybe a flat fan pointed you're at a 30 to 45 degree angle forward and one set up backwards either you could potentially set up one on the same um, nozzle or alternate nozzles down the boom but whatever you do you want to just get the best you know coverage of that wheat head as possible really really important if you're going after head scab and try to suppress that that mycotoxin that's on there any questions so far on fungicides or head scab so the other thing we have in your handouts there, um, I pulled apart the um, the um, the efficacy guide and basically broke it down just for the head scab products. So I think it's about eight, nine products on there now. So for the longest time we had Folicure, Tilt, Prosaro, Carumba, sort of our go-to products. So on that last page there, I put in those newer products. So there's three newer products now include Miravis Ace from Syngenta that's got a um, couple of different modes of action in it. Uh, Prosaro Pro from Bayer, a couple of modes of action in that as well. And then Spherix from BAS, BASF and that's also a combination type product. Um, and we're seeing equivalent activity of those products and we probably expect to see that given the makeup of those products. And I've got there the, the actual components like if it's Prothioconazole and the percentage in there. Um, but we're seeing Good, good efficacy of those products, very similar, if not better, to some of those um, older products. Um, I just, there's all sorts of things. Any other questions you guys have? Any comments? Nothing? All right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the modes of action then. So we're very heavily reliant on those DMI or the triazole uh, fungicides that's that's primarily that is what's in Carumba and Prosaro like that one mode of action or, or maybe two modes of action but it's that one uh, one type of um, product right that triazole type product um, they work really well the problem is you know when we spray and spray we may be selecting for resistance we have done some work to look for you know resistance fungicide resistance issues out there um, and I'm happy to report that we haven't seen any major concerns yet in terms of head scab um, fungicide resistance. There are some indications like the septoria leaf disease that we see that there is some fungicide resistance in that particular pathogen. So this is something we always want to be mindful of. Um, is, that, is that in just the triazoles, Marty, or are you also looking at we, UIs? We look at, we're trying to look at everything. So in terms of risk and where we'd expect to see resistance developing, the QOI is for sure. It's, it's more like a switch. You have this particular mutation, you are completely resistant to the fungicide. Uh, so QOI is the strobulurin type products. And just a quick note, we're not going to put those strobulurins on for head scab, right? You're aware of that because that can actually exacerbate the amount of mycotoxin that accumulates. So be very mindful, you need to use a product that's you know recommended and labeled for head scab management when we're thinking about head scab management. But yeah, so the, the strobulurins is kind of like a switch. When you select for that mutation, you're going to have resistance. The SDHIs, uh, which are now in some of our products uh, for head scab, like fluopyram is that compo component in Prosaro Pro and Pidiflometaphen and Miribus Ace. Um, it's, it's a little bit more black and uh, or grayscale rather. It's not you know, a switch and we get complete resistance generally. And then the DMIs, it tends to be a transition of slow sort of you know, build up a resistance, not, not so much black and white. So it makes it actually harder to look for when we go and do the screening, but still really important. We need to know that these products are working when we're putting them out there 
and any potential risks that are, you know we're starting to see develop. Um, yeah. Other questions or comments here? You guys are pretty quiet. Quiet as group so far. All right. So let's talk a little bit about fungicide timing then. Um, when do you think would be the most um, profitable timing, or, or maybe I shouldn't say profitable, but protect the most yield, I guess? That really early fungicide application, fix five, six, sort of, you know, post green up, flag leaf, or at that hit scab timing. What do you guys think is the answer to that? Across three timings there? Hit scab, yes, excellent. When would the, the, there can be exceptions to that. What situation would happen that head scab is not recommended or, or not ideal for that year? Dry it flower. Dry it flower. Yeah, maybe. I'm thinking more about the leaf diseases. So we think back to 2016 and that strike frost epidemic we had. Out here, if you waited until flowering to make that fungicide application, it was too late. It was game over. And even that very early application, that FIX 5.6, was too early for that strike rust epidemic that we had. At least in this location, and I think many other parts of the state, we had to have flag leaf protection out. So that flag leaf is really, really important for yield. You know, 40 to 60% of yield contribution from that flag leaf. So typically what happens when we go through it flowering and make that application, we're getting good protection of that flag leaf. Typically, you know, diseases haven't moved up at that point, And so we get good protection. So that flowering application from the data that we've looked at, we see about a seven and a half bushel protection, right? On average, that flag leaf only around about six bushel protection. And then we looked at that early, that fix five, six, and that's where we might be putting a, a fungicide in the tank with a herbicide. Um, any guesses as to the number there that we might see? Two, three, I think that's probably more like it. We saw four bushels, and I was a little bit surprised by that. I spoke to some of our colleagues in Ontario, and they, they tend to see about one and a half bushels. I think maybe what might be going on there is, is when we're calling that early timing, right? I think the later you push that, that early timing, the more return you're gonna see because you're, you're protecting those leaves for a longer period of time. Super early, there might not be that much disease there, right, if that makes sense. So, you know, we need to pull that apart a little bit more. I think the two to three is probably a more realistic expectation than the four bushel that we saw. I mean, it, it can happen, but it's always going to be dependent on variety, location, you know, the weather in terms of responses. Uh, and we looked at a whole bunch of trials to answer that question because we're always getting the question, well, should I just throw a little bit in because we're going across the field anyway and it's cheap? Well, yeah, you could do that, but if there's no benefit, why would you do that? Because now you're just amplifying fungicide resistance perhaps and, and there's no business economic benefit to it. But we were surprised by that four bushel, but maybe cautioned by Ontario only seeing one and a half bushel. Yep. Furthering the flag leaf, I mean, up in the thumb, we've seen a lot of late applications of nitrogen and the flag leaf got burnt and mm -hmm. then the dry weather and everything along with that. How much damage are we doing burning that? I think, depending on how much burn there is, quite a bit, right? Because that flag leaf is so important for, for yield development, yeah. So we, we want to do, I mean, from a fungicide standpoint, we want to do whatever we can to keep that flag leaf clean. Um, so again, being aware of, you know, disease issues popping up, make sure that timing is right. So yeah, I'd be, yeah, on that as much as we can be in terms of trying to minimize that burn. Yeah, that's a good point. What follow applications? Four applications of fungicides. I've certainly heard this. Um, out, out west, they talk about it quite a bit up in Idaho, Utah, and they, they said it actually helped them with their snow mold. Right, right. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess if, if you're in a situation that you've experienced you know, significant snow mold, then maybe you could try it. I, I think in general, the benefit's gonna be pretty minimal. Uh, and again, you know, if we're adding like you know, if you're going whole hog here, or fall, early spring, flag leaf, and then like, whoa, now we're, you know, we're on the road to fungicide resistance development, right? So that would be my concern. Um, I haven't, we haven't run any, I don't think, fall fungicide applications, so maybe that's something we should start doing. Um, at the moment, we've got some work with Kurt Steinke looking at, you know, nitrogen rates and fungicide without fungicide to try and pull that apart a little bit more, uh, answer that question, you yeah. know. 
Any other comments or questions? Dennis talked about virus, and you mentioned mm -hmm. virus as well. Yeah. We've seen some wheat streak uh, mosaic virus here. Can you speak to that and actually what's causing the Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I think what we need to do is like a, a survey across the state to get a better handle on exactly what's out there. You know, re-up the information so we can do a better job on the extension front. But basically, yeah, the wheat streak mosaic virus can be pretty devastating and there's, there's wheat uh, sawborn viruses as well. Um, so wheat streak mosaic virus is something that you can do. You can be very aware of, you know, where last year's wheat was, making sure that's terminated, not having any volunteer wheat. We've been hurt, have I already said this to you, you this group? No, no. I, it's so confusing when you go through this multiple times. But a few years ago, we did have some pretty significant uh, wheat streak mosaic virus, where we had, you know, um, last year's crop there, and we had that, you know, volunteering in the, in the you know, in that next season. And we're getting carryover over that mite from one field to the, to the new field, right? And so that just basically brought the virus with it. That, that wheat streak or wheat curl mites can also hang out in corn. So as corn's starting to dry down, that can also be a source of infection. So just being aware of that um, is at least helpful. And if, if you think you're seeing it, again, get a sample into the diagnostic clinic to, to know what's going on out there. Would a uh, help with that? Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. I think making sure we've got good termination of any volunteer where to be one of the go-to go -to, uh, tricks there, yeah. Now, I haven't seen any recommendations from counterparts in other states that have been dealing with that. Okay, thanks everyone.